Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you all are doing well today. Um, so uh, just to kind of give you all some quick updates on the course, uh, I did go ahead and enter in the exam grades. Uh, you all did pretty well overall. Um, so basically how I did that was I added a 10 point curve. That's going to be found inside the raw exam score. And the only exam score that I'm going to count is going to be the one that's going to be labeled exam one, exam two, exam three. Those are the only ones that factor in. Uh, so basically, that's just adding in the exam bonus points, uh, which I do encourage you all to earn. Just as a reminder, if you attend the class, participate in the discussion, uh, that's certainly a way to get bonus points. Uh, the other way to earn bonus points would be to participate in the discussion in Teams whenever I post the topic. Uh, basically, you have until the end of the day for whatever lecture it is. So for today, you know, if you want to reply to the Chapter 7, you have until midnight on the 15th. Uh, so I'd certainly encourage you to do that as well. It's a great way to make sure that you're in a good spot with your grade. Uh, but beyond that, uh, make sure that you do the assignments on time. Um, otherwise, of course, I don't accept late work. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, as long as you're doing everything on time, you should be uh, in a good place with your grade. Uh, if there's any questions about how the grades are calculated, be sure to let me know. Um, if you have a generic question about that, certainly you could ask me right now. You could ask me later. Uh, but if you have a more personal question, uh, you want to review your exam, something like that, I'm happy to do that. Just shoot me an email. Uh, we'll set up a Skype and I'll share your exam questions with you, show you what you missed, um, go over anything like that that you are curious about. Certainly happy to do that. Um, anyone have any exam questions that they'd like to share with the class for me to go over right now? Certainly open to that as well. Any tricky exam questions you weren't sure about, you want to ask, feel free to. Um, I don't mind going over it. Um, so. Well, if not, that's OK. Um, you know, like I say, don't ever hesitate to ask me anything regarding that. Um, but beyond that, uh, I do want to remind everyone I sent out the um, group discussion that we're going to be having Friday. Uh, certainly be a great opportunity to come and speak your mind uh, concerning whether or not we should have government regulations concerning, you know, information sharing, concerning things like how is information stored? How is it accessed? You know, what sort of uh, systems do we use? Should there be regulations surrounding that will be the first part of the question. And then the second part is, should firms be fined by the government for failing to uphold uh, what many would consider to be their obligation? So again, I want to remind you all, I'm not grading your opinion on this. It's a participation grade. So if you participate, you get credit. If you don't participate, uh, well, you don't get any credit there, but uh, certainly uh, it's not very difficult to participate. Uh, attend the debate slash discussion on Friday. It'll be after the uh, last little bit of class that we'll cover. So uh, next class, we'll cover chapter four. Anything we don't uh, finish in chapter four, we'll carry over to Friday. Uh, probably have some sort of activity on that day. And, you know, beyond that, uh, I imagine we'll certainly finish chapter seven today. Uh, looking over the schedule, looks like I listed uh, kind of covering anything left over from chapter seven and four. Uh, then Friday, probably just be from chapter four on Friday. So yeah, and, uh, if you're not able to attend it live, that's not a problem. Just make sure you submit a paragraph or two about your opinion and answer those two questions and describe why. Uh, so basically, if you think that it should be uh, regulated, then say why you think it should be. If you think it should not be, say why you don't think it should be. Um, that sort of thing. You all did a great job last time. I'm not too worried about it. Um, as long as you do one or two paragraphs, you get 100. Uh, any questions about anything like that? Well, also, don't forget to uh, do the Unit 2 quizzes. Uh, so they're going to be due. Let me pull up the schedule so I don't tell you all wrong. Um, I believe they're going to be due at 11.59 p.m. on the 23rd of July. So that's coming up. Uh, looks like you got a little bit over a week. So it's going to be due next Thursday. Uh, I'd recommend you go ahead and knock them out. Uh, make sure that you get a good grade on them as well. Um, you know, believe it or not, some people, um, you know, some students, uh, I don't want to say they don't have a good grade on them because good is relative or, you know, whatever. But, you know, for some students, it's their lowest category. You know, they did well on the exam and then they, 
you know, maybe didn't do as well on their quizzes. And uh, the quizzes are open book and open note. Um, you can use websites. You know, you can probably find the definitions on Quizlet. Um, certainly, I'd recommend that you, you know, get 100 on them. Um, you know, it's, you, you can't cheat on them. I'm not aware of a way you could cheat on the quizzes uh, because, you know, they're open book, open note by their nature. So, uh, yeah, I mean, don't feel bad if you're using Quizlet or you're using the textbook to, you know, take those quizzes. It's really more for a way to where you will be able to have some sort of homework grade and uh, not have to buy an access code. Because that's, that's what it is with Wiley Plus. You know, you can get the access code and it basically gives you some quiz questions. So, you know, I'm trying to save you guys some money there. I hope that, uh, hope everyone's okay with that. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to be too upset if I save them money, um, but maybe a few people will. Anyway, any other questions about anything before we begin Chapter 7? Again, never hesitate to reach out to me with any questions. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about Chapter 7. So, you know, last unit we really talked about what information systems are, how they're used throughout the organization. In this uh, unit, we're really focusing more on the specifics of information systems, you know, the specifics about how we would manage them, about more specific tasks that they would be used in. So, you know, we're going to start off talking about e-business and e-commerce, and that's going to be quite a timely topic right now. Um, given the whole situation, a lot of people are, uh, you know, avoiding uh, maybe going out in public. So they're using e-business or they're engaging in e-commerce. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Uh, but then, you know, in the subsequent chapters, we'll be talking about information security as well. You know, how do companies actually secure their assets? You know, how do they make sure that the information you're providing them is going to stay safe and secure? Uh, so then in addition to that, we'll cover social computing. And that's going to be pretty related to what we're talking about today where we're going to be, you know, getting companies, we're going to see how do they reach out to their customers? You know, do they use social platforms? Um, do they not do anything at all? Uh, those are certainly some things that they could do. Uh, then we'll also talk about data and knowledge management. That's going to be chapter five. Uh, that's a great chapter. We're going to talk a lot about how organizational learning, organizational knowledge is disseminated, um, you know, what sorts of systems can be in place to aid in that. And then the last chapter in this is going to be chapter 13 in this unit, rather, which is going to talk about acquiring information systems and applications. And that's where we're going to focus on the actual kind of managerial process behind either acquiring or making an internal application for the system to be used within the organization. So that's pretty much what this unit's about. Uh, it's a great unit. It kind of gets a little bit more operational. Uh, last unit was kind of high level talking about these are the information systems that we use. Um, these are, you know, how we use them, that sort of thing. In this unit, it's really more about specific uh, kind of more managerial focused uh, tasks. So I think it's a good unit. Uh, I think they're all pretty good units, though, so I might be a little bit uh, biased there. Anyway, let's jump into Chapter 7. So the two main topics for today are going to be e-business and e-commerce. And we're going to talk about what the difference between those two are. But let's first talk about e-commerce. So e-commerce is going to be anything where a good or service is going to be bought or sold online. So, you know, if you're using Amazon, that's e-commerce. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. If you're using Amazon to purchase or sell services online, that's going to be e-commerce. Amazon does, of course, do other things as well, although they're lesser known for those other things. And from a business standpoint, this is a really kind of transformative uh, technology because, you know, previously, if you wanted to buy or sell a product, you know, you could basically either sell it in like a yard sale or whatever, or to go to the next step and to reach more customers, you would have to purchase a physical storefront. Of course, you could lease it for, you know, some set amount per month, but that's going to have a very large barrier to entry. So I guess, you know, if you wanted to have a product that you're selling, it could be quite difficult. You know, there'd be a lot of upfront costs that you'd have to pay. And that level of investment could be, um, it, it could keep a lot of people from engaging in business activities. And it's, it's less scalable as well. So if you think about a physical storefront, uh, basically, how do you grow your space? Let's say that you start off and you have maybe uh, $10,000 a month in sales. Let's say that's your first month. Well, what do you do if next month you have 20,000? 
And in month three, you start to have 40,000 and, you know, so on and so forth. You're going to outgrow your space. And that's a challenge that physical retailers face. And it could also be a challenge that online retailers face as well. But, you know, in this situation, you're going to be able to have lower barriers to entry in the first place. And in addition, you're also going to have more scalable environments that you're going to be conducting your business in. So when we talk about this, you know, that's one example. But think about another example. What if you're a major uh, physical retailer? Let's say Sears. Let's say you're Sears Corporation and you have declining sales. You know, you have massive, massive stores that you lease or that you own. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of lenders aren't willing to lend to you anymore. And maybe a lot of uh, suppliers aren't willing to supply you anymore. So you're stuck with a bunch of empty space that's not making you any money. And, you know, e-commerce, I'm not going to say that it doesn't have that problem, but it has that problem to a lesser extent. So if you had a physical warehouse, you could uh, lease out part of the warehouse a lot easier than you could lease out part of a retail store. That could happen in both cases. But, you know, this, this really allows for a lot more market players to enter the market. So we look online to purchase something. You know, if you wanted to do that, you could certainly find lots of different providers. Uh, whereas if you're wanting to find maybe a local provider of something, you may only find one or two within a 50 mile radius of you, particularly when you're talking about specialized sort of niche goods. So that's kind of the whole concept behind having reduced barriers to entry is that it allows more market entrance in. And, you know, when you think back to Porter's five forces model, you know, having barriers to entry makes it, uh, you know, a less rivalrous industry. So if we're using e-commerce, we're probably going to have more rivalry. That's going to have lower prices. That's going to have more choice. And that's going to be, in most cases, good for consumers. Um, I can't really think of many cases where uh, lower prices are bad for consumers, but uh, someone jump in if you have an example of that, I guess. Uh, but, you know, in addition to this, there's also the concept of having a centralized market or a decentralized market. So basically all that's saying is, is that where are the goods being shipped from? Are they being shipped from a central warehouse, as the case a lot of times with Amazon and sometimes Walmart? Or are they being shipped from a decentralized location? So in other words, instead of you sending your good directly to your marketplace, you're going to be responsible for the shipping of your goods. And that's going to have some advantages and disadvantages, of course. So an advantage of a decentralized market is that it's often going to have lower operational cost for whatever uh, sort of uh, retailers are using it. So you know, if Amazon's going to ship your good for you, they're going to charge some amount to do that. Uh, it's not going to be a free service provided by Amazon. They're certainly going to maybe have that be. And in a lot of times, that's going to be passed on to the consumer. Uh, you know, why would you eat that cost and you know, have a minuscule profit when you could pass the cost on to the consumer who'd be willing to pay it? So, but that's basically the whole concept behind centralized market versus decentralized market. It's where is it being shipped from? So... Any questions so far? Okay. And uh, I do want to remind everyone, uh, you know, if you're watching this live, there are going to be about 10 or so different discussion questions. You don't have to participate in all 10, of course, but uh, certainly if you participate in one of the discussion questions, you'll get credit. So make sure that you stick around for that. Okay. So normally in class, I would play this video. It's a great video. It's put out by Bloomberg. Kind of regarding the rise of Amazon and some of the stuff that Jeff Bezos did early on to kind of help Amazon become what it is today. And it's an interesting video. Uh, I do want to caution you all. It does get into some political topics towards the end. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that I support the topics or that I don't support the topics. They're there. Um, you know, it's a, it's a video on the internet. I can't really help that, unfortunately. So normally I would cut it off before then, but certainly if you watch it, you know, on your own time at some point, uh, just know that I'm not, uh, I'm not either, uh, I'm neither supporting nor not supporting any argument that may be made in it. Um, just gets a little bit political there. Uh, but basically, you know, the whole concept behind what Amazon did is that they started off in the books market because, you know, Bezos recognized that a lot of books could be rare, they could be hard to find. Um, you know, maybe your local bookstore doesn't carry older books, maybe your local bookstore, uh, whatever the case may be, there could be certain books that are not going to be there. Uh, you think about a limited retail space, you know, 100,000 square foot, uh, even a large store like that couldn't have every single book ever written. 
Uh, but there's nothing stopping the online market from having every single book ever written. And he recognized that. And he also recognized that, you know, shipping of books is going to be relatively simple. Uh, you can use media mail, USPS. It's going to be relatively inexpensive. And it's also relatively difficult to damage a book. You know, if you ship a book inside of a box, as long as there's not a lot of room to kind of move around or whatever inside the box, it's heavily, it's highly unlikely to be damaged. Um, so, you know, there's going to be lower shipping costs. It's going to have books that you may not be able to find in other places. And that's going to be very beneficial for consumers. So basically, consumers liked it, and they purchased a lot of books from it. And over time, began to sell more things. Uh, he particularly benefited by the dot-com bust when most of his competitors, uh, you know, were no longer operating. You know, they'd gone under in, you know, early 2000s, particularly 2001, 2002. And, you know, that really kind of helped out Amazon because so many other people inside the e-commerce sector were no longer doing anything. So, you know, that's basically what the video says. And then it kind of talks about more recently some stuff that uh, Amazon's done, some stuff that Bezos has done. And again, that's kind of where I say uh, that's not something I'm either supporting nor not supporting. Uh, but certainly it's an interesting video. It certainly shows the rise of a massive corporation and one of the largest corporations today. So let's talk about e-business. We just talked about e-commerce. So, you know, e-business is going to be any sort of business activity that has an online component to it. So, you know, e-commerce is buying and selling of goods online. That's also an e-business activity. But not every e-business activity is going to be uh, an e-commerce activity. Uh, for example, if you have a meeting with your boss and you use Skype to do it, that's e-business. Um, you're probably not selling or buying anything from your boss at that point, but you're just you're meeting online. That's an example of an e-business activity. Um, you know, having anything that's done online is uh, probably going to be in some way or another e-business activity, uh, particularly if there's any sort of uh, business involved. Uh, so there's, you know, with this discussion, there's there's really a couple main types of retail environments we could see. So the first is going to be a brick and mortar retail environment. And in this retail environment, what we're doing is we only have uh, presence in a brick and mortar store. Now, you know, that's going to include things where you can only actually purchase or sell the good. I'm not going to include a web page in that and say that a web page is going to exclude it from being brick and mortar. Uh, I would say, though, if the web page allows for e-commerce, you know, you can actually buy or sell from the web page, then it would no longer be brick and mortar. Uh, and that's going to contrast with a virtual or a pure play organization. So virtual organizations and pure play organizations are interchangeable. Um, and what that means is that it's, it's going to be fully online. So everything within the business that it's doing, you know, the buying and selling of goods, uh, anything like that, it's all going to be done online. You can't walk into a virtual organization. Um, you know, they may have an office where, you know, maybe five employees work, but it's not open to the public. And, you know, in most cases, they, uh, they're not going to have an office. It's going to be a much smaller firm. Uh, certainly, I'd say over 90% uh, are going to be, you know, no physical office. It's going to be someone's house, basically. And going back to Amazon's example, that's actually how Amazon started. Um, started inside of Bezos Garage. So uh, that's an interesting thing. Uh, and then there's going to be something in between those two where you have physical locations and you also have, um, you know, online shopping available to you. So, you know, we think about uh, retail examples. Most of the retail chains today are going to be examples of click and mortar where they have a physical storefront and then they also have a website that you can purchase and sell. Well, probably just purchase. <laughs> I guess you're not likely selling on a website to a company, but you get the point, you know. So we have stores like uh, Walmart, you know, you can... Uh, order online for Walmart. You can also uh, go to the store and go into a Walmart and order. Uh, so that way, so you have different options there. So, you know, a good example of a brick and mortar store is probably going to be like a gas station. Um, you know, in most cases, I would say the majority of gas stations, particularly in rural areas, are not going to have a website where you purchase gas online. You know, you go to the pump, you pump what you need, and of course, it bills your credit card for that. Uh, that's, you know, that's pretty much how they operate. Uh, convenience stores are the same thing. You know, you're not likely buying online. You're getting the stuff out of convenience. It's at a, it has a kind of a geographic monopoly in that sense. Uh, not saying that every gas station does, but certainly 
it, it can. You know, it has that draw that it's close to. So that's going to be a good example of a brick and mortar only business. And then a virtual peer play organization. Just think about any business that you buy or sell from online that doesn't have a storefront. So there's a multitude of those. So does that make sense to everyone? Uh, certainly feel free to jump in, interrupt me if something I said is not clear. Happy to clear things up. So I got a question. So basically this class period right now is an e-business? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, this is uh, using uh, the Microsoft Teams platform, um, to, you know, conduct any sort of the business activities. Uh, I guess you all do pay to be a student. So, uh, yeah, it's a great example of an e-business activity. So, yeah, exactly. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, you know, I have in the slides here, this is going to be e-commerce types. I could really drop the E and just say this is going to be types of commerce. Uh, because, you know, frankly, there's nothing inherently uh, online about any of these. Uh, so, you know, first I have B2B. That, of course, is business to business. That's going to be any transaction in which a business sells uh, a product or service to another business. Um, so that's going to be about 85% of transactions in terms of uh, sale volume, at least, not in terms of goods sold, but in terms of the amount, you know, the values, you're looking at about 85% of transactions going to be one business selling a product or service to another business. And that's going to differ a little bit from business to consumer because in B2C, you know, business to consumer, we have a business that is selling a product directly or product or service rather directly to another consumer. So that's going to be where you walk into a store and you buy something. So, you know, previously, maybe you're purchasing something from a supplier as a business. Maybe you're getting some office equipment, whatever the case may be. It's going to be a business to business transaction. But if you, a consumer, walk into a store to buy something, that's going to be a business to consumer transaction. You're buying something from a business. Uh, C to C is consumer to consumer. That'd be you buying something from another consumer. Uh, so let's say that you see an ad for a car that you like on Craigslist. You know, it's an individual selling their car. Uh, if you went and bought it, that would be a consumer to consumer transaction. You basically purchased a good or service from another consumer. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, business to employee. That's the B2E I have there. And that's going to be any case where a business sells a good or service to employees. And we often see that with stuff like benefits that are sold through the company, uh, maybe some sorts of health insurance, um, retirement benefits. Those are going to be examples of business to employee transactions. It uh, could also be the case where maybe businesses are selling some sorts of meals or, you know, maybe they have a vending machine set up. Um, that could also be a business to employee transaction. So, again, you know, I have on here that it's e-commerce types. It's really just types of commerce. So nothing too, uh, nothing too difficult there. Okay, so then I also have some examples of e-commerce websites. We're just going to go through these briefly. Um, so... Of course, we have Amazon. We've talked about them, kind of shown how they're a more centralized market than a lot of other uh, kind of online retailers are in that a lot of times whenever you buy or sell a good online, it's going to go through an Amazon warehouse, whereas for most of these others, it probably won't, um, you know, at least in terms of if they allow for third parties to sell through them. Uh, so Chewy is an example of a pretty specialized um, sort of uh, e-commerce website where, you know, I'm pretty sure I, I'm not a... A chewy customer, but I'm pretty sure they only sell pet goods and services. I'm not even sure if they sell pet services, uh, but certainly, you know, I've, I've heard good things about their dog food prices or whatever. Um, heard it's pretty convenient. I'm not recommending them. I'm just saying that's an example of a kind of specialized e-commerce website where you can uh, purchase or sell, or really, I guess you're not selling anything through Chewy, but you can certainly purchase, uh, you know, pet supplies, I believe, through them. Uh, Alibaba, that's going to be a Chinese website where they sell um, a lot of stuff directly to businesses, but then they also have AliExpress where they sell things directly to consumers. And that's going to be a lot of times done in very large volumes. Um, it's going to be where basically customers or businesses can purchase things from China. Uh, most of it's going to be manufactured in China. Um, it's a very large company. Uh, a lot of the stuff that is purchased or sold at some point or another has passed through, you know, some of their uh, warehouses and some of their shipping containers. Uh, very large company. Uh, so Craigslist, of course, is going to be, I would probably say, one of the most decentralized markets there are. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not even sure they sell anything 
I don't think Craigslist, the company, does. Uh, maybe they do. I could be wrong. But, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that it's just basically a classifieds page where you go post an ad and, you know, someone responds or they don't respond. Uh, eBay, of course, is pretty similar to that, only it's a little bit more centralized, I guess. You know, they have kind of a, a more active storefront and they do get involved in some ways with, you know, conflict resolution, stuff like that. And then I have CDW up here. Uh, they're a large reseller of a lot of the electronics equipment, particularly for business-to-business -business transactions. Um, they sell a lot, of, uh, a lot of office equipment, a lot of technology to businesses. And, you know, they don't necessarily sell a lot to consumers, uh, but that's just one example of them. Um, so there's, there's going to be a lot of other things, you know, that kind of are involved. Uh, but, you know, talking about e-business, uh, there's really a lot of other topics that could go along with it. Uh, so we're talking about mobile commerce. Um, you know, as the name implies, it's basically, you know, doing commerce on a mobile device. So if you're using a mobile website, that's mobile commerce. If you're using an app, that's mobile commerce. Um, you know, basically stuff like that, where you're engaging in maybe buying or selling something using mobile device, it's mobile commerce. Um, would I make that distinction? Probably not. Uh, but, you know, just make sure that you know what that is. Of course, we also see a lot of examples of e-government, where, you know, rather than having to go to a government office to get something done, you can maybe download a form and fill it out, maybe submit it. Or better yet, they can use web forms and you can just submit whatever you need done, you know, the government that way. Um, also, they could accept payments and stuff like that for if you're paying your property taxes, if you're paying your vehicle registration, uh, anything like that. You know, we see a lot of uh, e-government, you know, driver's license renewals. I'm pretty sure you can do those online in most states now. Uh, so, you know, that's one example of, you know, using the technology in an effective way that's going to save the government money. And it's going to save you a lot of inconvenience having to, you know, go to the uh, government office when they're open. Uh, they're not always open. Um, you know, there's not going to be any lines online either. I mean, that's going to be uh, a better experience for most consumers. And then lastly, social commerce would be where you're using social media to either promote the selling of or maybe even to, you know, engage in some sort of social activities with the shopping. This could be things like using customer reviews. That's an example of social commerce. Could also be things like websites where they adjust the price depending on the demand. Uh, that could be social commerce, depending on how it's configured, of course. So, you know, there's going to be lots of different options for what e-business are. Uh, but, you know, talking about business in general, it's important that we consider the business model. So the business model is basically just a model that we've kind of described where we're saying this is what drives our revenue. So we're going to have lots of different predictors of that. We're going to save those as our X variables, where we're going to basically plot out each and every factor we believe to be important to determining our revenue. So... You know, for example, let's say that we're going to do a simple gas station example. So maybe we'd have several different predictors of revenue. Maybe we would have amount of competitors, you know, because in, in theory, we'd imagine that if we had one competitor versus 20 competitors, we'd imagine that it, that would affect our revenue. So that could be one uh, predictor variable. We could also have things like the average amount driven by a local customer. Because, you know, gas price is going to be directly tied to demand, you know. So if, there, if the demand goes down, then we anticipate our revenue will go down. Um, maybe we'd also have things like gas prices. Uh, so if the price that we pay for gas rises, uh, you know, we may start to see some degree of a decrease in overall demand. Uh, such that people would seek alternatives to driving. Now, of course, uh, gas would be an example of a lot of cases in inelastic uh, demand. You know, it's not going to be completely inelastic, but it's definitely going to lean inelastic um, because, you know, people, for the most part, in normal times, I guess, uh, they're going to have to get to work. You know, they're going to have to go buy groceries. They're going to have to do whatever they do. Maybe they go to church on the weekends, whatever they're doing. They're not necessarily likely to completely change that. So, you know, th that'd be kind of an example. But, you know, you kind of see the point that, we have different predictors that we believe to be important in determining our revenue. And the whole purpose of doing this is to see, you know, how likely are we to survive? Are there things that we could do to make us have higher revenue? Because increasing revenue in most cases will, of course, increase our profitability. Now, 
if we're increasing our revenue or decreasing our profitability, it means we're probably selling things too inexpensively. And we need to do some stuff with pricing. But this lets us see that. So that's kind of the whole purpose of having a business model and ultimately having you know, some sort of regression equation where we actually model this out and we, we actually show you know, what is making a difference in our revenue. So any questions so far? Certainly feel free to jump in with any questions. Uh, you know, the, one of the most important things from a business perspective when we're talking about you know, having uh, electronic business and business done online, how do we get paid for it? Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, that's something we thought of. So you know, a lot of times if we're having very large payments, we may want to have you know, online checks used. So basically that's just gonna be your routing number and your account number. And that way we're not having to pay any sort of processing fees um, saves the company money, but from a consumer standpoint, you know, you miss out on your credit card rewards or you miss out on, you know, your fraud protection. Um, so it's probably not going to be the best uh, in terms of, you know, providing the customer of benefits, but certainly providing the retailer of benefits, it, it does a good job of that. So the flip side is, of course, we can accept credit cards or debit cards. Um, and that's certainly uh, going to be pretty common in a lot of business to consumer transactions because people are more comfortable spending with a credit card than they are spending with a you know checking account. Um, you know, I, I imagine that uh, you know most people would not want to give you know every single business their checking account information. It's very difficult to change that. Uh, whereas with a credit card, you know, let's say a credit card gets compromised, well, you get a new one in three days, so that's not as uh, not as less advantageous for people. Uh, you know, of course, a lot of people as well are using online banking services. Uh, something like as of 2018, 70% of consumers are primarily using online banking as opposed to, you know, visiting a physical branch to do basic things like, you know, deposit uh, cash, you know, deposit checks, you know, make withdrawals, that sort of thing. A lot of it's being done online now, and I think that trend will probably continue, um, you know, particularly given the current situation, but also given the fact that it's just more convenient. You know, if you can be sitting at home, you don't have to worry about when the bank's open. You know, you just do it whenever you want to. So that could be a lot more convenient. Okay. So, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, having this whole business being done online. You know, we've talked about you know, what that kind of looks like. But let's talk about one of the most important concepts behind this, and that is the concept of disintermediation. So disintermediation is probably one of the most important concepts from this chapter, if not the absolute most important concept. And what happens inside of disintermediation is we're basically reducing the length of our supply chain. So down here, I have an example of a common supply chain where basically you have raw materials that are getting purchased by suppliers. It's going to be purchased by a manufacturer, then it goes to a wholesaler, uh, then it goes to the retailer, and then it goes to the consumer, or the customer rather, and then ultimately the consumer. Uh, sometimes the customer and consumer are gonna be the same, but a lot of times they're gonna be a little different. So that's a good distinction to make you know, between the customer. The customer is the person actually purchasing the product or service. The consumer is the person who ultimately uses the product or service. Um, so a lot of people don't make that distinction, but I do. Uh, of course, it's not on the test, but it's a good thing to know. Anyway, got a little bit off, uh, off topic there. So basically in disintermediation, what we're doing is we're removing some aspect of that traditional supply chain. In most cases, it's gonna be removing the sort of wholesaler, we're removing the distributor. Um, and we're basically going directly from manufacturer to consumer, or maybe we're going directly from manufacturer to retailer. Um, but you know, in, in most cases, what this is gonna result in, this is gonna result in a lower cost of goods sold. So we think about you know, each of these different uh, aspects of the supply chain. Each of these uh, you know, people are going to take some amount for their profitability. Uh, that's just the nature of things. You know, if you're a supplier, why would you not take any money for profitability? Um, you wouldn't be a supplier for very long if you weren't profitable. Because uh, what would be the advantage of doing business? You, know, you would get nothing for it. So you know, as we re remove those layers or remove those components of the supply chain, we can actually reduce the total cost of goods sold. So let's just say we have a raw material. Um, let's use, um, I don't know. Uh, let's just start at the supplier level. I think the supplier level makes more sense. Let's say we start at the supplier level and let's say that a computer manufacturer can sell a computer to a manufacturer 
you know, the total, basically every single supply that the manufacturer purchases adds up to $500. So the manufacturer takes all those different components and they put them all together inside of a laptop. And, you know, once they've done that, they're going to charge $700 for the laptop. And then that goes to a wholesaler. They may charge $800 to a retailer. The retailer may end up charging you $1,000 for a, a laptop that's basically $500 worth of parts. So if you remove the wholesaler, you can basically save $100 on the cost of goods sold because now there's no longer a wholesaler. It's going directly from the manufacturer to the retailer. Or better yet, let's say you go directly from the manufacturer to the consumer. Uh, that's what Dell and Apple did early on. You know, in the early 2000s, they basically said, we're not necessarily going to put our products in a lot of retail environments. Instead, we're going to sell them directly to consumers. Um, of course, uh, Apple since kind of changed a little bit on that. They're in uh, a lot of Best Buys and whatnot. But uh, certainly early on, that's what their strategy was. They're going to have disintermediated markets. And, you know, you can really do a couple things with those savings as a company. So first, you could reduce the cost of the product to consumers. So that's certainly one option. Uh, another option, of course, would be to do things like uh, actually take that money and increase your profitability. So you're still going to sell the $500 laptop to one, for $1,000, but you're going to be quite profitable in doing so. Uh, and that could be very beneficial for a firm to do. Uh, of course, you could also do some combination of the two. So maybe instead of selling the uh, laptop for $800 or $1,000, you're going to say, well, I'll split the difference. That's another option. Of course, there's an infinite amount of ways you could split that difference, and that's pretty self-explanatory there. But really, the whole concept behind disintermediation, it's a very simple concept with a very uh, complicated name. But thats it's a very important concept as well. So any questions about that? Certainly feel free to ask any questions. Again, it's a very important concept. So, you know, in addition to buying or selling of goods and services online, we can also promote our goods and services online. And of course, we can do that in a lot of different ways using online advertising. So with social media, uh, you know, recently there is a pretty large uh, boycott, actually, of some social media for advertisers in particular. And again, I'm not going to get into the politics behind it, but just know that uh, that's something that, you know, could be something you'd want to follow if you were within that market. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, you could uh, maybe gain customers, maybe you could take advantage of lower prices, maybe you would uh, lose customers, you know, whatever the case may be. You'd certainly want to be mindful of what's happening within the general environment whenever you're making decisions as to where to advertise. Uh, so social media, you know, traditionally is going to have pretty low cost to advertise on. Uh, same with online ads, where basically you purchase online ad space on, you know, various content and, you know, maybe you target it towards specific people. Uh, maybe you don't, but that's certainly options you have. So with social media, uh, a lot of times you're, you have fewer options to do that. But if you're using online ad platforms, uh, you could certainly suggest or you could uh, basically require your ads to be on certain types of content. Uh, maybe you want them to be on uh, blogs for outdoor activities. Let's say your Bass Pro Shop, you want to get your name out there. Uh, you could certainly select inside of various ad platforms. I only want to be featured on uh, you know, various blogs about outdoor activities. Uh, I'm not interested in being on a blog about uh, beauty care. That's not something that our customers are likely going to be very interested in. Uh, you know, the same would be true. Let's say that you're a, let's say you're a makeup company or something like that. Uh, you, you probably would not do well to have untargeted advertising where you're reaching out to customers who are, you know, reading content on a, um, I don't know, on like a hunting blog. You know, that, that's just those two things typically don't go together very well. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, there aren't some exceptions to that, but, you know, for the most part, it's important to tailor your uh, marketing toward, you know, the demographics who are likely to actually be interested in your product or service. Uh, I think that's pretty uh, self-explanatory there. So with online advertising, you have the options to be able to do that. Uh, of course, that's going to have some controversy associated with it, uh, particularly when we're talking about social media. Um, you know, people may be a little bit hesitant to uh, support a company that would do something like that, where they would uh, target customers who would be more likely to purchase or sell uh, goods to them. Uh, that could be something that could be uh, problematic down the road. But anyway, you know, that's uh, kind of getting off topic a little bit. So, you know, we also have this idea of permission marketing. 
And permission marketing is where we send out a flyer to our customers. We say, hey, would you be willing to sign up for a newsletter? You know, we'll send you some discounts. Maybe we'll send you some new product information. Uh, and, you know, if you do that, that's going to be permission marketing. You, the customer gave you permission to market to them. Of course, it's going to contrast with non-permission marketing, uh, which is spam, where the customer doesn't really give us permission to send information to them. So generally speaking, spam is going to be pretty heavily frowned upon. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, you know, with this, you know, we're going to talk more about customer relationship management and all. But for now, just kind of remember that with online advertising, we have lots of options available to us to reach out to customers in a more effective manner. Uh, so again, you know, there's, there's going to be a ton of issues and controversies associated with this. So the first of them is going to be dynamic pricing. And this is a uh, practice where the prices are going to be adjusted heavily based on demand. And this can be done you know, within a matter of minutes. Uh, so for example, if you're going to rent a hotel room for uh, a home game weekend, uh, you're going to pay a lot higher price than you would if you're renting a hotel room for a you know, just standard weekday. Uh, and the reason for that is because demand is substantially higher. So we think back to a traditional model uh, for supply and demand, you know, as the demand increases, you know, what's going to happen to prices? In most cases, they're going to increase because people are willing to pay more. Um, certainly not every single consumer may be willing to pay $400 a night for a hotel room, but there are people who will. Uh, so therefore, we're going to price it to those people who are willing to pay it. Um, that's dynamic pricing. Um, it's going to be heavily influenced by demand and other factors. Uh, with technology, we can do this a lot more than just adjusting the room by day. We can adjust the room rate by consumer. Uh, so maybe certain consumers are going to be uh, more focused, more maybe more price conscious than others. So, you know, maybe we actually charge some people more just because we can. Uh, that's certainly something that happens. I'm not saying it's good or bad, uh, but many people would say that's a bad practice. Um, many people would also say that's a perfectly fair practice. Uh, so, you know, dynamic pricing is also seen a lot in airline tickets where, you know, the more you search for something, uh, maybe the higher your price is because it's showing the companies that you're really wanting to get the ticket, you know. Um, so, you know, a way to get around that would be to use like incognito or private browsing modes on your web browser. So that way, any sort of, uh, you know, tracking cookies or anything like that, it's not going to be sh uh, sh uh, saved. I kept wanting to say shaved there, but that's not right. Yeah, it's not going to save any of your, uh, you know, what you've been searching for, basically. Uh, so that's certainly uh, something that could be interesting to kind of discuss further. And you'll probably see a discussion question in the next couple slides about that. Anyway, so multi-channeling. So, um, so it's like dynamic pricing, kind of like price gouging in a, in a way? Um, you know, it, it certainly could be. Uh, we think about what price gouging is. Uh, typically, we think of price gouging as the inflation of prices during an emergency time of some sort. Like, you know, often during a hurricane, uh, you may see the price of bottled water and maybe plywood, you know, go to a substantially higher amount than it would be under normal circumstances. Um, you know, I, I think by definition, uh, dynamic pricing, depending on how it's configured, uh, could certainly be that. Let's say that uh, right now, you know, if a dynamic pricing system is in place to adjust the price based on demand, and let's say the demand for hand sanitizer goes through the roof, well, the price for hand sanitizer by that logic is also going to go through the roof. So. In that case, it could be considered price gouging. I'm not saying it would be. Uh, price gouging is really more of a kind of a legal concept there. Uh, but certainly, you know, adjusting the price based on the relative demand would be what this is all about. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see what you yeah, see. It. Gotcha. Yeah, great question. So, you know, multi channeling is basically where we're going to have both an online presence and an in-store presence. And, you know, with multi-channeling, the whole goal is to have those uh, two kind of presences be unified. They're gonna have the same prices, the same products, the same service, whatever we're doing, we're making sure that they're not gonna have discrepancies. A lot of times we do have discrepancies though. Um, you know, for example, is the cost of an online good the same as the cost of a uh, good you purchase in a store? Depends on the store. Um, you know, certainly think about uh, if you were to buy maybe a pallet of, you know, let's say you get maybe 48 cans of beans. So if you're ordering 48 cans of beans, it's probably going to be more expensive 
to have it shipped to you from a store than it would be to go to Costco and pick it up yourself. Um, you know, that's certainly going to be one example of it, but I don't think Costco really sells that kind of stuff online. I could be wrong. Um, but anyway, you kind of see the point there. You know, there could be cases where there's going to be pricing discrepancies, and that can really raise some issues. Um, you see a lot of stores, actually, where if they have, um, you know, a price match program, they actually exclude their own online retail space. So that's kind of funny. Uh, I think Best Buy does. I know they used to. I'm not sure if they still exclude their online uh, prices, but that's kind of humorous. They'll honor other people's online prices, but not their own. Uh, it's kind of funny. Um, maybe not if you're a consumer who had to pay more, but uh, probably just buy it online at that point. Anyway, uh, so fraud misrepresentation, that speaks for itself. You know, anytime you're having a product advertised and you're not living up to the definitions of what you're advertising, that's going to be fraud. Uh, it's going to be misrepresenting what the product is, you know, and that's going to be something that's going to be illegal. Uh, it can certainly get you taken down. Um, so ethics, again, you know, we talked uh, last slide about, you know, the ethics of using, uh, you know, kind of targeted marketing approaches. Um, th there's going to be a whole big debate. We're going to have that in a couple slides here. I'm not going to participate in the debate this time. Don't worry. But, um, you know, th there's going to be a lot of different opinions about what should a business do? Should a business only be concerned with making money and anything else goes? Is there some sort of, uh, you know, corporate social responsibility aspect to it? You know, it, how do we draw that line? I'm not here to give you an answer. Um, other things like sales tax collection. Should online retailers collect sales tax? You know, that's uh, uh, many states are passing legislation to ensure that they do collect sales tax from any goods or services shipped to a particular state. Um, and that's something that, you know, allows the states to kind of mitigate losses from uh, maybe where they otherwise wouldn't collect revenue. So that's talking about the state governments, of course. Um, you know, it's one way for them to do that. And then lastly, the uh, whole issue of cyber squatting is you can basically purchase domain registrations where you can basically purchase the rights to use a domain. And if you do that and you purchase it for someone else's property that you don't own, uh, that'd be the issue of cyber squatting. For example, um, let's say that I wanted to purchase the domain name of like um, uh, some business that for whatever reason doesn't have a website yet, but they, they have an existing storefront. I'm just going to throw an example out here. I know they actually have this website, but let's say that Exxon Mobil wasn't registered to Exxon. Uh, and I go online and I purchase their registration rights to use the ExxonMobil.com domain. Uh, and let's say the Exxon Mobil Corporation didn't have access to that domain. That'd be cyber squatting. Uh, a lot of times this happens where the person who has uh, the rights to the domain uh, is actually going to demand some sort of ransom, in other words. So they're going to demand like maybe 10, 20, sometimes $100,000 to transfer the ownership over. Uh, and that's considered by many to be unethical. Uh, in some cases, it's also considered to be illegal. Uh, I'm not going to get into the legality of that. That's certainly a, a topic that um, is well beyond the scope of this class. But just know that uh, it's going to be a practice that is going to be potentially illegal. And in many cases, many would consider it to be unethical. I'm not here to tell you whether it's unethical or not, but just certainly be aware of that. Let's just kind of wrap things up. Uh, we talked about e-commerce, how it's very popular. Uh, it's certainly becoming even more popular as uh, you know people are staying at home. Uh, maybe people are um, a little bit hesitant to go out to shops, and not everyone is, of course, but some people are. Um, you know, it's going to be something where uh, you know it'd be interesting to see how this takes the next decade. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our uh, physical retail chains are closing. Uh, they're in a lot of trouble. Uh, Pier One's in a lot of trouble. Sears is in a lot of trouble. Uh, Kmart's in a lot of trouble. JC Penney's in a lot of trouble. You know, I could go on and on with major retailers who are having a lot of trouble right now. And that's a very unfortunate thing. Um, is it because of e-commerce, e-business? Maybe. Is it because they failed to adapt to changing circumstances? Maybe. Is it because they took on too much debt? Is it because they expanded too rapidly? I mean, you could, you could certainly uh, take a lot of time to determine the exact causes. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of different opinions on that. So speaking of different opinions, uh, why don't someone take a crack at this question right here? Does disintermediation lead to increased efficiency in the supply chain? Yes or no, and why? So 
So I just want to remind everyone, if you participate and you answer a question like that, um, I'll make sure to write your name down and add in two bonus points for the exam too. So anyone want to take a stab at this? Is it okay to say it depends because it depends on the product and the market you're um, going for or, we, or do we have to pick a side? No, you don't have to pick a you don't have to pick a firm side. Just say what your opinion is and defend your opinion, basically. Well, because um, based on the definition of it, it seems that like it depends on how if it's something that's a very technical product and has a lot of parts and pieces to it. Let's say like an F one fifty, it's better to to have a longer supply chain so that you have every intricate piece into it, or else the whole truck is going to fall apart but something more of a basic product like a book i could see where that's a lot um it would um disintermediation would work a lot better something like that okay yeah we'll talk more when we get a supply chain chapter about you know the different tiers of suppliers you know you have tier one suppliers tier two suppliers tier three suppliers you know all these are intricate parts of the supply chain like you mentioned kyle uh so great question our great our response there anyone else want to throw in something about it I would say yes as, as well. And why would you say yes? Because disintermediation is like when you're removing the middlemen and, you know, supply chain is like getting goods and services to a market, market quickly and efficiently. So I think, you know, that would help, you know, do that job. Great response. Let's see some other uh, responses. Does this intermediation kill jobs? Again, there's no right or wrong answer here. What's your opinion? Anyone want to give an opinion here? I think it can kill jobs because you're taking out the middle man. You're taking out somebody that was doing that job. So um, I think it does take out jobs. Okay. So, you know, you, you're basically removing certain aspects of it. And, you know, that's certainly one approach to look at it. Yes, uh, yeah, it looks like uh, Sydney said no, since they would probably be doing it for another business. Um, you know, and that, that's another approach. I mean, there's there's no clear answer to does it, you know, kill jobs or not. I mean, there's certainly some approaches you could look at some evidence and say yes. You could also look at other evidence and say no. Um, I'm not going to say what my personal opinion regarding it is, but uh, let's look at this next question here. Is e-commerce beneficial or harmful to society? Who wants to take a stab at that? You're talking about um, like selling goods online through an online platform? Yeah, is that good or bad for society? I mean, I would say it's uh, good. Okay, why would you say that? Um, Just because the platform is bigger, you know, say you're a small business owner and you have a store located in one particular point. You know, everyone's not going to be able to go to that one store just because of geographics. But say you had a website where people could go online and look too. That's more money coming into you and your business just because, you know, your platform is bigger for people to be able to access your materials to buy. Okay. Yeah, great, a great, uh, great answer there. Anyone want to jump in with anything else? Uh, to add to that, it could also be like you need a, uh, a product for something and it might not be in a store that's close by you so you have to order it so that i think that would help people out as well okay so no, another great response there anyone else want to jump in here with anything yeah i also agree just because it's very convenient when it's online rather than having to run out and go to the physical store okay a lot of people like the uh, e-commerce i see i uh, hope you also like online classes uh <laughs> That's a little joke there. It's not that funny, but uh, we'll move on. Uh, how do you predict e-business will change the future of business? Uh, so you can answer this one in any way you like. Let's hear it. It kind of already is the future because um, it goes with the whole automation kind of we talked about in the first unit. That's what's going to propel industries forward and I, I just see that that's how all the markets have to survive at this point because that's the trend and it's only going to keep growing because technology just gets better and more technical and more precise as time goes on. Gotcha. 
Anyone else want to throw anything in here and uh, say anything regarding it? Any sort of predictions about? Now, this is really the definition of opinion question right here. You know, how do you predict that e-business will change the future of business? Um, anyone else? Certainly feel free to jump in. Uh, okay, let's go on to the next question here. Uh, is online advertising intrusive? Yes, no, and why? I say yes and no, because I think we talked about it last week where, uh, say, if I was on the internet looking at clothes, I ended up going on Facebook, I see ads popping up about clothes, like, it's just in that way, I think it's intrusive, but in other ways, it's just convenient because it's like, okay, yeah, I was looking at dresses or something. So perfect. It's there. I don't have to like look it up or so. Yes and no. Okay. And it probably depends a lot on the advertising if it's completely untargeted advertising. Uh, so I guess if I would ask this question in a better way, I'd ask is targeted online advertising intrusive? I mean, I, I think, I think, yeah, uh, it is kind of intrusive. Because yeah. um, if I'm looking up a certain, um, you know, product, you know, it is convenient, you know, that I see, you know, ads directed towards that product I was looking up. But I look at it also as like, how did you know that I was looking that up? Yeah. You so. know, this is, you know, like my phone, you know, the phone is supposed to be secure and stuff. How do you know? that I was looking up, I'll say it happened to me with Apple watch wristbands and like every ad on every social media app I went to had just ads about Apple watch wristbands. And I was like, how did you know that? So yeah, I did feel kind of invaded just a little bit. Okay. Yeah. There's going to be a, a wide range of, uh, you know, opinions and, you know, answers to this question. Uh, let's see. looks like we got some stuff in chat. Um, you know, a lot of people think it's, Kind of strange and a little weird. Um, you know, again, I'm not here to say it is or is not. It's really for you all to say. Uh, anyone who hasn't either put something in chat or spoken, uh, let's try to hear from you all if we can. Uh, is permission marketing superior to non-permission marketing? Has anyone not spoken? Let me compare my notes to attendance. Actually, it looks like everyone's already spoken. So uh, someone take a stab at this if you want to. Is permission marketing superior to non-permission marketing? Yes, no, and why? I'd say yes, because in non-permission marketing, it's more, um, it'll have more of a negative reaction to the customer because they'll be like, well, why is this here more often than a positive? So then they're not going to want to buy the product because they're just going to look at that's in their way. Okay. Uh, does anyone feel differently? Um, anyone like non-permission marketing? That's kind of a funny question. <laughs> uh, it's okay if you do, though. Um, yeah, I, I imagine most people would probably answer this question by saying, you know, permission marketing. You know, making sure that your customers consent to sending them a newsletter is probably a good thing. What about dynamic pricing, though? This is going to be an interesting one. Is dynamic pricing ethical? Anyone want to take a stab at this one? So, you know, dynamic pricing, of course, is the, the concept of charging different prices depending on demand. Is that ethical? Is it unethical? Is it neither? What do you guys think? Let me ask it this way. Um, imagine that I had, um, let's just say I had an Airbnb. Uh, would you think it's unethical if I adjusted the prices depending on how many people searched for a particular weekend to see if it were available? 
Would that be ethical or unethical? I would say that's unethical. Okay, why would you say that? Just because, I mean, once you realize that there's a bunch of people searching for it, uh, you'd raise your price, and that's kind of, I mean, some people might already go ahead and book it at the last minute. You raise the prices, and it would, some people would probably get mad because they might be trying to find a cheap place, and yours might be perfect for it. But then you realize that there's more than one person that's trying to get it, and you just raise the price on them. Okay, certainly one approach you could take there. Uh, anyone feel differently? Uh, you know, from a consumer standpoint, I think that uh, dynamic pricing can uh, certainly uh, test the limits for what we're willing to pay. Um, you know, regarding if that's good or bad, I, I think it's probably a bummer if you're a consumer. Uh, let's see this one. Uh, let's skip this question. This is not going to be a lot. Uh, this is going to be a good one right here. Should taxes, or should not, should taxes, should states collect sales tax on online purchases? What do you guys think? Should Mississippi be getting uh, sales tax on goods you buy or sell from online retailers or whatever state you're in? And you really don't even have to say why on this one. You can just say, yes, I think they should or no, I don't think they should. It's only one more question after this, by the way, so we're almost finished. Well, I'll take a stab at it, then I'm not going to say what my actual opinion would be. Uh, but, you know, proponents of states collecting online sales tax mention that it, it, it levels the playing field. You know, in other words, physical retailers are required to collect sales tax that costs them money. It also makes their products that they sell more expensive, particularly when we're comparing to you know, online retailers who don't have to have that expense and they don't have to have their products be that much more expensive. Um, you know, a lot of times sales tax ranges from you know, a couple percent to sometimes upwards of you know, 10, 15 percent. Uh, that's a lot of revenue the state's also missing out on. So if I were a customer could save, you know, let's just say an average of 10 percent, by purchasing my goods or service in a situation that's already being more convenient for me, it certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, whereas uh, people who are opposed to states collecting this sales tax, they may say something to the effect of, well, this, the business isn't actually operating within that state that it's in. You know, let's say that it's a case like um, a lot of businesses that aren't operating. Let's say Costco, for example. I don't believe they have any locations in Mississippi. If I buy something online from Costco, why am I paying taxes to them? They're not really benefiting from anything in Mississippi. Uh, not directly, at least. I mean, you know, they're using a shipping company. Maybe the shipping would be taxed, but, you know, the product itself really doesn't make sense to be taxed. That's how some people would approach it. So there's really two main arguments you can present there. Okay, last question. This is a simple one here. Is e-business ethical or unethical? The whole concept of e-business, good or bad? Anyone want to take a stab at this? It's pretty straightforward, and it's not like it's portraying, um, as long as they don't break any privacy barriers, it's ethical. Okay. Uh, does anyone think it's unethical? Yeah, I mean, like Kyle said, as long as they're doing everything according to the law and they're not, you know, uh, kind of violating anyone, I mean, it's... I think most people would probably say it's fine. You know, it's not going to be unethical in and of itself. Um, so that really wraps up today's, uh, you know, debate or discussion, whatever. Uh, not really a debate, but uh, certainly a discussion about the topics. Uh, next class, we'll cover information security. And uh, whatever we don't finish up next class, we'll carry over to Friday. And we'll also have the group discussion on Friday. Uh, if there's any questions, let me know. If not, I hope you all have a great day. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording.